Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, my name is Sebastian Müller. I am a member of the Institute for Mediterranean Studies, and uh, the title of my talk is The Impact of Ancient Greek Migration on Sicily, the case of Morgantina. When I talk about Greek migration, then I actually uh, mean the Greek colonization. I just want to use a little bit more neutral term for that. And uh, at the beginning, I will talk a little bit faster because I think the most important thing is coming at the end of my presentation and I don't want to miss that. So hopefully I don't make too many mistakes along the way and hopefully you can follow. But let's see. And maybe just at the beginning as an explanation, uh, the Institute for Mediterranean Studies has, um, has a research agenda and it is changing over time. At the moment, um, the focus is on Sicily. And what we're usually interested in is uh, the encounter of different civilizations and cultures in the Mediterranean. So the, the mode of the encounter and the outcome. In my talk, I will talk um, a little bit more about the how, not about what was the outcome, because that is, you could say, quite clear. So I would like to make a suggestion how it came to this outcome. That sounds maybe a little bit abstract at the moment, but you will see uh, very soon what I'm talking about. Okay, so Morgantina is a um, historical and archaeological site in central southeast um, Sicily. It is located in the edge of the plain of Catania. And here you can see an image here is uh, the place, the location of the site. And the background is uh, Mount Etna, and here's the plain of Catania. When we look at uh, the, the last stage of the Greek migration or Greek colonization movement, then uh, Sicily looked a little bit like this here. We have three local tribes, the Illumians, the Cani, and Sicils. This is, this is also the tribe that gave uh, the name Sicily to the island. And then we have a number of Greek cities in the, along the southern shore, the eastern shore, and the northern shore. And additionally, we have also Phoenician settlements in the west. So this is actually a quite uh, complex and complicated um, situation, right? And automatically, the question of ethnicity would come up here. And traditionally, ethnicity played quite a big role in, at the beginnings of archaeology. Changes of assemblages and of artifacts were always uh, explained in this way. Meanwhile, we understand that material culture is not necessarily and also not mainly connected with ethnicity. And it is also nothing that is really um, ingrained in the body, or let's say it's not a genetic thing. It is um, a process of choice and manipulation and also a political issue. So that makes it already complex and complicated. But if we look, for example, at the situation of the Greek settlers at this time, they could uh, identify with uh, the, their city state, where they were coming from, or where they were going to here in Sicily. They could identify with the region. We know that Sicily was uh, later in time a quite uh, important reference point for identity of the people of the Greek people coming from here. And then we also have the Greek tribes like Dorians, Ionians. If I talk about the Greeks, then I don't uh, want to imply that this was a homogeneous group. You know, I I just use it for the sake of simplicity. We have to think of that um, there were several groups with different interests and different modes of interaction with the local population. When we come to the local population, it's similar. I showed you there are these three tribes, what we have archaeologically absolutely no indicator that they were kind of unified under a central um, government or power or whatever you want to call that. It looks more like that we have individual groups of local people living here in Sicily. And um, we have to imagine Greek people arrive on the shore of Sicily. And here, maybe in one area, they would encounter people who were quite friendly to them. They just travel 20 kilometers down the coast and would go out, would go out of their ships and they maybe meet uh, a group of people which is quite hostile. So the situation was uh, probably very complicated. And I think uh, at the current stage of research, we cannot make any generalizing um, statements about the encounter and also not the local response on the arriving people. That's why I think we have to go, uh, we have to look at these kind of things case by case. And the case in this talk now is Morgantina. So Morgantina is interesting and in so far because it, we could say uh, these are three cities or let's say two cities for the sake of simplicity here. And we have one city which is uh, on the so-called Cittadella Hill. This is the archaic city, the older one, the local city. And then when this city was destroyed, 
this city was outlined and built. And uh, what is special about this one, it is a completely Greek city. And it looks like that the local population, maybe together with other groups, maybe with uh, other Greek people, built this Greek city. And there are not so many traces anymore of um, actually, you know, the local, the, the local background. And the question is now, what happened? So here we have just uh, another view. This is the classical city in the foreground and in the background you see the Citadella Hill where the uh, archaic city was um, outlined. From um, the historical point of view, uh, Morgantina is also mentioned in the historical sources. We know that um, the archaic city was maybe constructed around 550 BC. It's a, a dense occupation with houses. We also have a later a fortification wall and according to the historical scriptures in 459 BC, the city was destroyed. And indeed we have a destruction layer at this time. And uh, as mentioned, the people didn't rebuild the city on the Cittadella Hill anymore. They moved to the Sierra Orlando and built this classical Greek city. So here we see the outline of the archaic city. You can also see there are several areas that have been excavated over time and this is here um, the plan from the central part and you can see here this kind of dense house occupation with the street system and so on. What makes the settlements uh, special is we don't have only domestic structures, we also have um, cemeteries. And as you can see the cemeteries, so these are these kind of gray plots here, are distributed on the um, steep slope of the Citadella Hill. And we have several of them and they definitely belong to this settlement phase. And here you can see how these graves actually, what they look like. These are so-called rock cut chamber tombs. Um, they have different size. They were used over a longer period of time. And they also include several burials, not just one. And here, um, yeah, just short uh, descriptive statistics. Altogether, 67 chamber tombs are known from this area. Only 45 have been documented. And only six of the, uh, 16 sorry, of them uh, were intact. The reason is because these chamber tombs actually were open all the time. Uh, in later times, uh, there was some sediment coming down the hill and was actually closing the entrance. But in ancient times, it was obviously all the time possible for people to enter the graves and just remove um, grave goods, bones, whatever they wanted. Nevertheless, we have um, 114 graves. And you can see most of them, actually, we have different kind of burial types, but most of them are just the dead person was put on the floor on the bench, but we also have a number of um, Greek burial types here. Yeah, and here you can see an example of one of the smaller um, chamber tombs, and this is a dis distribution of artifacts here, and you can see it looks really messy. Um, and the same is true for this one here. This is a bigger chamber tomb, and I think that shows a little bit better what was going on. You can see some of the, oops, uh, some of the, skeletons here and uh, some of the grave goods. And you can also see that quite a lot of grave goods are here along the wall of the chamber tomb and also some dislocated bones. And what would happen is if this chamber tomb was just full and there was a need for a new interment, people would just push the bones and all the artifacts aside, all the objects aside and would put the new burial here. And of course, this leads to the pro uh, problem that we cannot really um, connect the burials with the grave goods anymore, at least in this case here. So what are actually the Greek elements in the city? So we can distinguish between the domestic context and the, the burial context. From the domestic perspective, we see that um, there are nice koi, long houses, bigger houses uh, with the Greek background probably that were used for religious purposes. We also have architectural terracottas that belong to the archaic period. This one was not found uh, on the Cittadella, but on the Cerro Orlando, but it belongs actually to the period when the settlement on the, uh, on the Cittadella was inhabited. We have in the settlement itself, we have this uh, so-called four-room building, which is considered to be a facility for symposia, this kind of highly regulated um, Greek drinking party, let me call it like this. And we have particular construction styles, uh, which are considered to be connected with Greek people. And we have large amounts of Greek pottery. And some of them also have graffitis with, uh, in a Greek alphabet. When we look at the cemeteries, then um, we have 
as I mentioned before, we have a number of burials that are also in the, in the Greek style. And if we look at uh, the inside the burials themselves and look, for example, at the pottery, and pottery is usually um, easy, it's easy to determine where the pottery is coming from. So we have um, pottery that was produced locally in Morgantina. We have pottery that was produced by Greek people in Sicily. And then we also have pottery that was um, uh, produced in the Aegean area. And what we see here is that in most graves, we have actually a mix. Yeah, in some instances, just local pottery, as you can see, but most of the time it's local pottery and then a mix of all the other things together. So what are the assumptions that we can make based on the archaeological record? First of all, Greek religious practices obviously played a role. Greek lifestyle played a role and Greek language and writing was uh, present here at the site. And with all of these things together, again, the question of ethnicity is coming up. And traditionally, um, we would look at the burials and would say, okay, we have a burial here with a lot of Greek elements inside. Maybe the person who was buried here was a Greek. But as I showed you, this is quite difficult in case of Morgantina and is probably also not a really strong argumentation anymore. And there are other suggestions. For example, this one here from, Ste uh, from Stefan Burmeister in 2000, um, he said, if we are searching for a minority of people in, who is living uh, among, for example, locals and of a bigger population of local people, then it is maybe not such a good idea to look at the burials because um, the pressure, uh, burials actually or funerals are public events. And there's a big pressure of um, a minority to adjust to these kind of expectations from the majority society. It would be better, he argues, to look at the domestic context because here people tend to be more conservative. Maybe they store some items from their old background. That would be really nice to do. Uh, I cannot do this for Morgantina because the domestic uh, fines and so are not um, published so far. So I have to stick with the burials. And he suggests also something else. He said, maybe it would be a good idea to look at burials of children and individuals of a low status because there the expectation is uh, smaller that they are also um, buried in, in the conventional way. And indeed, in case of Morgantina, we have this burial plot here, which is completely reserved for children. And also all of the graves here, uh, all the types are actually connected with the uh, with the Greek background, with the Greek cultural background. So from this perspective, it really looks like that we have a smaller group of Greek people or single Greek individuals living here among the local population of Morgantina. Okay, but how did it happen now that we come from this um, archaic uh, city to the, uh, to the Greek, right, to the classical city? How did this process of Hellenization actually happen? And I suggest there were three stages. First one is encounter. This is the time when Greek people would arrive at the shore of Sicily and um, would get into contact with the local population. The local population is encountering these Greek people and they have objects that appear to be exotic and special. They are rare. Maybe there's also some kind of um, you know, perception of magic or esoteric knowledge connected to them. And there is another mechanism that is working here, and this is a mechanism that we can see from prehistoric times up to modern times, uh, and we can observe that in almost all societies uh, in Europe and in Korea and so on, that's called elite distinction. The upper stratum of a society always tries to distinct itself from the rest of the society in some way, and in ancient times, but also in modern times, using exotic objects, for example, is a good means to do that. And this is uh, what happened, obviously, or what I think that happened. So the elite would just include some of these foreign objects into their inventories. They would also place them in the graves as prestige goods. In the second stage, um, this would be the normalization of the context. So the Greek cities are fully established now at the shore of Sicily, and we have a stable contact with the local population. And now something happens that is bad for elite distinction because the normal society or the not just like said normal people also can have access uh, to these very rare and expensive goods. And now they're actually not rare and expensive anymore, right? So also the, the normal people would include that in their inventory and would place it in the graves because there's another mechanism that you can observe everywhere and it's called elite emulation. A lot of the times the rest of the society wants to follow the elite and is just following this kind of tradition. What is the elite doing now? They have a problem. 
they want to uh, distinct themselves again from the from the common society, but they have to do something else than just uh, using the foreign objects. And I would believe that they would adjust more to Greek customs like religion, writing, language, uh, including the symposium, for example, into their um, into their lifestyle. And in the graves, generally, we would see now that a lot of Greek goods are included and in, uh, graves with uh, of a higher status and also of a lower status. And then we have stage number three, and this is a transition. And here we have something that I would call is a really this, this actual transition of identity because by adopting these kind of foreign customs, these Greek customs, like religion and uh, the symposium and so, something is shifting. I would say the cultural memory is changing. Cultural memory is a term that was coined by the, um, by the um, Egyptologist Jan Asman. And uh, it actually is, um, to briefly explain, the cultural memory is actually the long-term, the collective long-term uh, term memory of a community. This is referring to all the events and narratives that is keeping a community together. And there are also, um, there are ways how to recall it. And this is usually through ritual to festivities and um, festivals, something like that. If these are changing, also the cultural memory has changed, all these narratives where people are coming from. And um, this, of course, has some impact in the end also on the, the burial customs again, because now um, all the goods in the burials would be used in a more um, original way or let's say in a transcultural way because local population and the, the Greek um, settlers would of course create something new. It's not completely Greek, it's not completely local, it's a kind of new uh, thing, but with a very strong uh, influence from the Greek side. Um, just let me think, is there anything else? Um, no, okay, so, and to conclude that, and I'm really fast as I just can see, um, I just made this diagram and it is actually, of course, not um, exhaustive and many, many other uh, aspects would go, uh, go together here, but as a conclusion. So we have these goods of a Greek origin. They come into the society. We have the elite, which is using that as a means of elite distinction. Later, the rest of the society would follow elite emulation. This is changing stepwise the material culture. And this also has an impact on the burial customs. Then we also have something that is uh, called the agency of things. And uh, maybe here in this case, it's important to keep in mind that we are talking about uh, rock cut chamber tombs that were constantly accessible and they were used over several generations. Mm. That means uh, people would enter these uh, chamber tombs and they would see maybe that their grandparents or some people, some members of their groups, of course, we don't know if there were uh, families interred or other communities, but they would see that uh, the older burials also include mm, this kind of Greek objects, Greek pottery, for example, and other things, other artifacts. And that would also reinforce this kind of new cultural, this narrative from the cultural memory that uh, there is a link to the Greek, uh, to Greek ancestors and whatever, because you can just see that directly. My grandparents were using Greek artifacts. Of course, the grandparents were including these artifacts for completely different reasons. Um, but for the later generation, this is of course not that easily uh, comprehensible. And this is what I would call the agency of things because the objects in the graves also put, uh, impose somehow their own interpretation on us, on the human beings. And all of this leads to the change of cultural memory, the Hellenization process, which is then uh, in the end expressed to, uh, to a change of the actual identity of the people. And this is how we in the end have how local people become Hellenized. So I see I uh, just even used less than 20 minutes. I rushed really a lot. I tried this talk several times. Sometimes I needed more than that. Um, I'm not sure if because of all this kind of fast talking and so that I really could convey my basic ideas uh, in a comprehensible way. But of course, I'm, um, really, um, I'm really looking forward to any kind of questions and comments from your side. Thank you very much.